Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Kent City Council Committee of the Whole Meeting. Today is Tuesday, May 11th, 2021. This is a remote meeting due to the COVID-19 health and safety requirements and by order of the governor. So welcome to anyone that is joining us this afternoon on um, our Facebook Live, on the YouTube Kent TV 21, and also anyone that is calling in this afternoon. We will go ahead and get started with our agenda. And first up is roll call. So Kim, would you please call the roll? Council President Troutner. Here. Council Member Boyce. Here. Council Member <coughs> Fincher. Council Member Core. Here. Council Member Larmer. Here. Council Member Michaud. Here. Council Member Thomas. Here. And I have noted the mayor is in attendance today also. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Kim. I just want to say hi to Council Member Fincher. She is watching us live on um, Facebook. She had a little knee surgery yesterday. And she's doing awesome, but we're letting her have a little time to recover on her own. So welcome, everyone. Um, are there any changes to the agenda from council or staff? None from staff this afternoon. Perfect. We will go ahead and move on then to department presentations. The first presentation is payment of bills. All council members get that through email. So um, with no objections, we will go ahead and move that forward to the consent calendar and then move on to the next presentation, which is an ordinance amending Kent City Code 1508.070 to ban rooster ownership in Kent. And this requires action by council. Hello all, my name is Sam Alcorn, a uh, planner with the City of Kent, and I'll be presenting today on the Zoning Code Amendment to ban roosters in the City of Kent. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, this Code Amendment is being brought to City Council because uh, there are periodic noise nuisance complaints uh, about the frequent crowing of roosters, especially in the spring and summer. And our code enforcement officers in Kent have expressed that the existing code is difficult to enforce. Um, and uh, that's specifically because they need to be present to hear uh, the actual code. So if you go to the next slide, uh, you can see the current code uh, language here. Um, I guess starting off, the Kent residents are allowed to keep a certain number of fowl uh, and fowl can be ducks, goose, geese, uh, swan, chickens, uh, and roosters. Um, however, uh, they it's, it is deemed a nuisance to have uh, any animal that has frequent crowing or makes any other no, uh, like noise nuisances that disturb neighbors. And so it's uh, that specific uh, noise nuisance uh, in Code 1801 that code enforcement officers are finding difficult to enforce just because to issue a civil penalty, they, they need to be there and record the noise nuisances as they happen. And I think that's been difficult for roosters um, because it, it can be at all times of day and uh, it, uh, as communicated by our code enforcement officers is has been hard. Uh, next slide, please. Council Member Thomas, you have your hand up. Do you wanna ask a question before we move on? Oh, you're on mute. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, I do have some chickens and a rooster across the street, but that's not the problem. It's a billy goat uh, that's a really noisemaker. So I'm assuming that that might be included in there. Uh, so are you referring to like construction noise uh, as far as building code? No, no, a goat. <laughs> oh, billy goat. I thought you said building code. Um, so uh, there are, <laughs> here, uh, I do have <laughs> pulled up. Um, they do have, or, sorry, the city of Kent has a, a section on larger domesticated animals um, and uh, limits those to lots on at least 20,000 square feet. Um, and, and I think it's that noise nuisance um, would apply to a whole lot of different uh, animal noises. And so... Uh, I think that the Kent City Code 1801 there mentioned in the previous, uh, sorry, in this slide, uh, yeah, harboring any animal that has frequent or habitual making of noises. So that, that would 
include billing goats. But uh, yeah, today we're, we're focusing on roosters uh, because our, our code enforcement officers have, have brought it up that the rooster crane, specifically in the spring and summer, have uh, become a nuisance and, and difficult to enforce. Um, and uh, I've done a little bit of research into uh, other cities, other, other our neighbors here, and how they uh, regulate the crowing of roosters. Uh, and in Auburn and Renton, uh, they uh, completely ban them. Uh, in federal way, it takes a, a bit of a more nuanced approach. Um, they allow them in certain zones, uh, the suburban estate zone, uh, and then also included a, like more of a phase out date for once the ordinance was passed, uh, anyone owning a rooster would have that amount of time to remove from their property. So uh, we did receive a few public comments before uh, taking this to the land use and planning board hearing. Uh, the first was from Erica Overall uh, in May 21st, or sorry, uh, March 21st. Uh, and it was in regards to her next door neighbor who had uh, quite a few roosters and geese and provided dates and times of crowing uh, really all throughout the day. Um, and mentioned that this neighbor was under criminal investigation for an alleged cockfighting operation. Uh, and Ms. Overall also asked that geese be banned along with roosters because uh, they were also being uh, fairly noisy. Um, and I guess a, a few more details here on that cockfighting operation. Uh, it was mentioned in a, in a recent Kent Reporter article, um, you know, cockfighting is just illegal in the state of Washington. Uh, the, Kids, or the King County Superior Court uh, has a trial date set for this individual. Uh, when they, uh, I guess, came to enforce the, the uh, action against the alleged cockfighting operation, they removed 91 roosters uh, from that property, uh, Miss Overall's neighbor, uh, and along with other evidence for a cockfighting operation. Uh, however, Miss Overall stated that there were still a, a large number of roosters uh, that remained in addition to geese, even after 91 roosters were removed from her neighbor's property. Uh, and so uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, we did hold a public hearing with the Land Use and Planning Board on April 26. Uh, and a normal public notice was given uh, for that public hearing and two members of the public attended uh, to provide comments. Um, both were neighbors of the cockfighting operation and uh, both expressed that the noise created by their neighbor with the, you know, a pretty uh, a large amount of roosters and geese uh, was really negative affecting their quality of life and just you know, every, every moment of their day uh, hearing crowing throughout the night uh, in the daytime and uh, was was really uh, yeah m making it tough for for them to live there. Um, the land use and planning board uh, expressed support for banning roosters, um, and they did consider uh, including geese uh, with the ban, but uh, decided since there was no prior history to geese complaints uh, from our code enforcement officers, they would revisit that in the future if it uh, became a continuing nuisance. Um, there was a one month uh, deadline for rooster removal uh, after the 30 day effective ordinance date, uh, which the land use planning board uh, supported. And then the LUPB voted unanimously uh, to recommend the council to ban roosters in all zones. Uh, and I guess to elaborate a little bit more on uh, the public comments that were given uh, during the Langston Planning Board. Uh, one was from Dan Sutton. He, uh, again, was a neighbor of that cockfighting operation and said that um, at one point there were over 100 roosters uh, that were there. Uh, it really wasn't the hens uh, that were creating any disturbances, but uh, the roosters that would really crow day and night. Uh, and then Erica Overall, who submitted the comment before uh, the land use and planning board meeting uh, elaborated a little bit more on our situation uh, and uh, made one comment that that stood out to me and um, said she counted 30 crows in one minute uh, from uh, just kind of keeping track of, of the crowing uh, uh, from her neighbor's property. Uh, and so after that hearing, if you go ahead, oh yeah, you're already on there, the next slide. Um, 
Oh, sorry. Uh, Do you want to ask a question really quick before we move on as well? Yeah, I just have a few questions. But first, first and foremost is the removal of the roosters. I mean, what are we expecting the uh, individuals to do with their roosters? Because that's sort of concerning to me. And um, and we've been getting a lot of emails from our community who's opposing the rooster ban. Um, I know several neighbors who have hens and roosters. So just trying to figure this out, how, you know, uh, how we want to go about this. And do people have hens just for the purpose of eggs or they also, um, you know, are trying to hatch those eggs or those eggs? So just a few questions. Yeah, uh, thank you for your questions. And it, it was interestingly, after the Land Use and Planning Board hearing, um, there was a Kit Reporter article um, on the, that hearing uh, that generated a lot more public comments after the public hearing. Uh, and so I think that, that that does bring up some of the uh, concerns that you, that you mentioned. Um, I'm not aware of what happens to the roosters after they're uh, requested to be removed. Um, I guess as well, I'm not really aware of what uh, chicken owners uh, intend to do with uh, the eggs that hatch. Um, however, uh, from the comments that were submitted after uh, that public hearing, there there were uh, definitely quite a few uh, that I, you know, folks that emailed me directly. Uh, three uh, that opposed a full rooster ban. Um, they, they were claiming that roosters protect their hens from eagles and coyotes, um, that they can't have baby chicks without roosters, uh, suggesting more of a, a limit on the number of roosters uh, rather than a complete ban. Uh, and then I actually also had uh, two different uh, rooster rehoming organizations uh, reach out to me, uh, and they're not located in the city of Kent, uh, rather in, in surrounding areas. Um, but they stated that uh, a lot of these organizations are at capacity and don't have room to rehome roosters. Uh, and then a consequence of this could potentially be uh, that roosters would either be illegally abandoned or killed. Um, and then a, a separate, pretty lengthy letter from uh, a group called Rooster House Rescue uh, from Fall City, uh, also met, opposed, strongly opposed the ban um, and brings up a, a lot of points for consideration, but it's a, a pretty lengthy letter. Um, and I'm happy to send you all of the comments uh, if you would like to consider them. Um, but, uh, and then in addition to that, I've been told that uh, several rooster owners have uh, expressed um, on nextdoor.com uh, opposition to the rooster ban. And so uh, th these were all received, you know, either th this week or at the end of last week. And so relatively recently, um, uh, however, I, I think um, addressing a little bit about what was in the Kent Reporter article that was published on May 6th, it has a, a bit of a misleading headline. I believe it uh, stated that uh, the Kent is uh, considering banning roosters uh, to manage cockfighting. Um, however, you know, I think that was a, a little misleading because cockfighting is already illegal in Washington and uh, we brought this code amendment forward uh, in response to noise complaints. Um, and so I, I think that kind of brings a my presentation here to the conclusion, if you go to the next slide, uh, I think staff, uh, in light of all of these recent public comments um, on both sides of the issue are really seeking uh, the opinion of council for some next steps. Um, so the a draft ordinance has been included in your packet with the approved language from the land use and planning board. Uh, however, we're curious if uh, you believe that some further public outreach uh, would be desirable, uh, you know, perhaps taking a, a different approach to uh, limiting the number of roosters or um, as the city or federal way does, uh, having some exemptions for different zones to have rooster ownership, uh, specifically agricultural zones or SR1 zones. Uh, and so uh, I'd be happy to hear your opinions and I'm available to answer any questions. 
Thank you, Sam. And I really appreciate you um, doing that extra work to include information that we've heard recently from both sides. But I do know my colleagues also want to weigh in on this. I'm going to start with Councilmember Boyce, followed by Larmer, then followed by Michelle. Thank you, Madam President. I'm also in agreement with Councilmember Core, right? I mean, I think here recently we have got more emails opposing. I think we will continue to get more. I think it need to be clear what problem we are trying to solve, right? So if it's cockfighting, then, you know, that's a totally different story, right? I mean, I got a rooster in my backyard. I mean, it doesn't bother me, right? So I can see if you got 90 rooster, that's a, that's an issue, right? So I just, uh, you know, I don't want us to react too quick, you know, based on, I mean, we need to hear every voice, right? So I just, I know for me, I'm not ready to take any action on this here, right? Because I don't think personally, there's enough information uh, been out there uh, to really for us to go left or go right. So I just know what we need to be clear what problem we're trying to solve. The first email we got was referring to cockfighting, right? So to me, that's a totally different story. And then I just, I'm not ready to go anywhere with this here. And I just think for me, I personally need more information. I'm kind of with Councilman McCore about, you know, we, we're getting getting more emails about not opposing this year and, and where the roots are going to go, right? So, you know, so that's just my two cents. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Boyce. Councilmember Larmer. Yeah, I'm definitely with my colleagues on this one um, where I feel like I need some more information. I really, I'm a city girl. I know nothing about <laughs> fowl. And, and so I don't know, does every rooster crow at 5 a.m. if it's one in your backyard or, you know, two on a property an acre over, can you hear? So, uh, yeah, I feel like I need, I, I'm given the public input we've gotten, I, I'm, I'm, leaning towards a more nuanced approach. And I feel like I need a little bit more information about um, how to make that that decision or, or a, a different approach. I'd like to know like, yeah, the, you know, how many do we even have in Kent? Um, how loud are they? <laughs> you know, um, Yeah, I, I, I'd like some more information and, and, and to maybe consider some other options than a full out ban. Thank you, Council Member Larmer. Council Member Michelle. Thank you, Council President. Yeah, I agree with my fellow council members. Um, I want to hear more from the public. Um, you know, I've known people who have tried to get rid of roosters, and basically you need to find someone who is willing to eat them, which also means that they need to kill them. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to get rid of them. Um, and then also, I don't, I'm a little confused on how banning roosters will take care of this problem of cockfighting. I mean, this person's already going through the legal system and it already isn't following the law. So I'm not sure that us banning roosters will do anything for that. Great point. Thank you, Councilmember Michelle. Councilmember Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, yeah, I know where they're going. Everybody's going on this and I, I agree, except that I have two neighbors, uh, one across the street, one down the street. And they each have they have chickens, and they deliver eggs to the neighbors. Um, so I think we need to talk about this and limit the number of roosters, maybe because we're in a, what, 4.5 homes per acre, I think it is. And so, you know, we're, we're still right there in the city here on East Hill. So uh, I'm thinking maybe one per 4.5, you know, go out to two per larger you know, uh, acreage, uh, that kind of a legislation. It's the it's that dumb billy goat that I can hear for three or four blocks away, and uh, I'll have to follow up on that one because uh, it's not cockfighting we're addressing here. We're addressing noise ordinance here. So I think if we look at it from an approach maybe to limit the number of roosters, because um, my one family across the street is Ukrainian. I doubt they could even understand what we're doing here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Thomas. Councilmember Kaur, did you have additional questions or concerns? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Sam, for um, trying to answer all of our questions. Um, I also want to know how many complaints do we usually get in a year um, about rooster complaints? Because um, my neighbors, like I said, have hens and roosters, and I hardly hear them. I mean, I maybe just I'm a sound sleeper. I don't know, but I don't. I, I they don't bother me. Um, but everybody's different. But and 
I think I'd be comfortable with more public outreach and limiting number of roosters. And also maybe, you know, just keeping in, getting more feedback from our community and exactly where they stand. Because lately we've been getting a lot more emails about, as my fellow colleagues said, you know, opposing the ban. So uh, I don't want to just go with the ban at this moment. I think we need more information. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Kaur. Aaron, I know you've received a lot of, or been seeing a lot of these comments that have come in. Do you have something you want to add at this point? Yes, thank you, Council Members. My name is Aaron George. I'm the current planning manager for the city, so I um, supervise Sam and the other planners. Um, I just wanted to address a few of the questions raised by the Council Members and just hone this a little bit so we know what we're uh, coming back to you with. Um, so just to clarify, um, I think the cockfighting angle may have caused a little confusion, um, which um, was not helped by the Kent Reporter headline, but um, that was the source of the, the first com complaint that came up in this effort. Now we do get um, a regular number of complaints every year, particularly in spring and summer. I don't have the number in front of you, in front of me, but I can, um, we can bring that back to you. Um, however, this, this particular homeowner who showed up at the hearing um, and her neighbor um, were complaining about their their neighbor who had been accused of cockfighting and, and that was being looked into. So that's, you know, that's a fact that um, that was part of that complaint. And it, it's what kicked off this uh, this effort because the complaint went to city council originally, uh, if you recall, I think last fall and city council members, I think it, uh, council president Troutner um, asked staff to look into it and to consider um, bringing forward a code amendment on the topic. So that's why we're back with you today um, after some research. And we did find resoundingly that code enforcement officers do um, get a huge volume of complaints and they find it very difficult to enforce that code uh, as written. So what's currently happening is people will complain, they'll go out there, they're unable to capture the, the rooster actually in the act of crowing. And so then it, you know, they'll come out and try to do it a couple times, but a lot of times they're not able to. And so then the issue just goes unresolved. So code enforcement um, specifically asked for a rooster ban as well as these residents that commented to begin with. Um, but now that it's gotten out in the news and people are seeing it and it's gotten more attention, we are hearing, like you said, more uh, the other side of the issue uh, that are opposed to the ban. So um, it's really kind of one of those 50-50 issues. There's two sides to it, but there is some nuance that we can look into. Um, so I'm hearing that we should come back with some information on um, the volume of complaints. Um, I heard how many homeowners have um, chickens or roosters, but unfortunately we don't have that data. So we will not have any way to obtain that information unless we were to do some kind of an online survey, which is something we could consider. Um, and then I'd be curious to hear if the um, council members would like more information on um, limiting a certain number or uh, limiting to particular zones. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Great, thank you, Erin. Council Member Larmer. Yeah, so I just wanted to reiterate, you know, that kind of actually what, you know, Aaron was saying that um, it's really about the noise. And I know that, you know, I'm on a lot, which I think we're eight homes per acre. And I certainly don't think I would want a rooster crowing at the break of dawn next to me, especially in the spring and summer when I do have my windows open. So when you come back, I'd be very interested in knowing sort of like how far Far does the average rooster crow noise carry and you know and, and what options based on that distance might we have zoning wise because I you know I definitely want to respect um I like to sleep past dawn and I want to respect that of our residents as well so so yes yeah, so I'd be very interested in the dynamics of the noise complaint itself thank you council member Boyce yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Madam President. And thank you, Aaron. That really helps a lot. Uh, I'm a Southern boy, right? I grew up in the South and I heard rooster a lot. Right? <laughs> I was brought up, right? So I just think, you know, once again, just want to reiterate, um, you know, I personally would not um, be in favor of a, uh, a complete ban, uh, maybe some limitation. And then also, I think Councilman McCord mentioned about, you know, where the rooster going to go, right? I mean, that needs to be part of the equation too, right? Not that we have any control, but definitely need to be able to understand that, right? So, um, and I don't think we're in a rush to do this here, Council President, really. So, I just, in my opinion, you know, 
Uh, we need to hear more time, like I said earlier, to hear from the public. Because like I say, you've got both sides of the equation. And uh, I'd like to try to hear as much as I can from both sides of the equation before we take any action on this here. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Michelle. Thank you, Council President. Yeah, I agree with um, Council Member Boyce. So I guess I would like to look at the zones and then also limiting the number. And then also I'm wondering if anyone on this call has reached out to the overalls. It kind of sounds like this property owner has too many birds on their property. So that seems that, that would be in violation of our code as well. So just wondering if there's another way that we can help them fix their problem. Thank you. Councilmember right. Michaud, I can answer that real quick. Oh, go That's ahead. All right. mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so we have been in touch with the overalls and um, the uh, criminal investigation is ongoing, which is why we haven't interjected with code enforcement. So they have a, um, a hearing on the criminal case in July. So um, we've been just waiting for that because already a bunch of roosters were removed um, by anim animal control as part of this action. Um, I'm not sure why there's some remaining or not, but we have to let that um, play itself out before we then um, take action on any remaining birds. But we will certainly do that when that's done. Great, thanks, Erin. All right, um, Derek, do you wanna kind of give us some thoughts on next steps and um, where we can proceed at this point? Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Um, so staff will do a couple of things. Um, first, I'll ask our social media team um, to invite input. Um, we have a council meeting coming up next week and then uh, again on June 1st. Um, and we'll invite them to attend those meetings if they'd like or continue to um, email comments in. And then staff will work on some more information and then come back with a couple of discrete options. And I heard an interest in limiting numbers and also limiting zones. And so we'll uh, we'll have a complete package of that, the input, uh, answers to your questions and some discrete options. Great, thank you, Derek. So with that, we will continue this discussion um, again at a later time and not be moving this forward. And moving on to the next department presentation, which is on a police data, computer, and uh, associated accessories purchase. So James Endicott. Thank you, uh, Council President. So good afternoon, Council Members. Uh, in 2020, during our budget process for IT for the 21-22 biennium, uh, it was noted that a large portion of the police department's mobile data computers, also known as MBCs, uh, were at the end of their life cycle. Um, as such, an associated budget request was made for the refreshing of the existing MDCs and then associated infrastructure within the vehicles. So in support of that life cycle of the MDCs, I'm here today to request the approval um, of the attached purchases made through uh, Synex Corporation's master agreement with the National Cooperative Purchasing Alliance and are within the established budgets uh, previously approved by council. Uh, I also additionally request approval for future purchases throughout the term of the master agreement and any authorized extensions as long as they're within the established budget. Um, the current project is estimated at about 159,000 and uh, is primarily funded through the IT hardware life cycle. Any questions? Thanks, James. Anybody have any questions on that? Uh, so what is, what is, tell me a little more about the NBC. What is, I know, is it a radio frequency? Tell me a little more about what that is, please. Yes, Customs Royce. It, what it is, it's literally a computer. It's a tablet computer. Uh, to GTAC is the model that we use. And it is a fully blown computer that is installed in a mounting system, docking station. It has a, an associated the infrastructure that I refer to. It has a mobile uh, router, so they are constantly connected to the internet. And so they can run all of their uh, checks, uh, do research directly from their vehicle. So it allows them a much better picture of kind of the what they're working in. So it's a full blown. Each vehicle is a full blown data center on wheels. So this is for fifty five, and that means you got another fifty two you need to done later. Yes, sir. So uh, great point. So in all, there's about one hundred and seven or so total vehicles, uh, police vehicles. 
Originally, when we started, uh, we pivoted to this new uh, platform in uh, 2015. Um, at that time, we did not have a per officer uh, a strategy at the city, right? There was one car would be shared across multiple officers. And so we only had around 55 or so. But uh, over the last couple of years, as we've gone to a per officer car, the fleet has expanded to 107. And so during that time, there have been subsequent uh, uh, purchases made, and those have been uh, those purchases have been made through the police department's process for procurement. So they build the cost of the MDCs, the infrastructure inside the car, into that whole package of of the police vehicle. And so IT then notates that they buy these uh, devices. We keep a list of them, and then we build into our hardware lifecycle every five years to replace these devices. Any reason why we don't stagger these versus get them all at one time, or that's just where we're at today? Um, so normally, so normally we would uh, typically do kind of a staggered, you know, maybe twenty or thirty every year, and then you hope by the time you get through that life cycle, you start back at the beginning. Um, but the reason we're we're not there on this one is primarily because in 2015 we pivoted platforms. We used to be on a different platform. We completely pivoted to a new platform, and so we had to do what we call a forklift. And that's what we did. And so now here we are, uh, we'll do 55. And then over the next couple of years, we'll do a couple a year. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. That. All right. Thank you. Council member Larmer. Thank you. Council president James. I'm sorry. What year did you say you did that platform shift? Uh, 2015. 2015. Uh, okay. I'm, con um, I'm just a little concerned. So we're doing, we're putting the money and the time into the uh, data collection analyst and assessment right now. Is there any potential that what they come back with as far as recommendations could impact this purchase? Would we need a different platform, different configuration, different hardware? I just wanna make sure that we're accounting for that before we go purchase something and then maybe find we needed something yeah. additional. No, that's a good question. At the end of the day, um, this platform is really agnostic of what it's going to be used for. It doesn't matter if it's being used just for email or for um, the tools that they use. It is a computer that they can use whatever it is. So okay. whether it's data collection for something else or for mobile com, it's a, it's a mobile platform they can use. Okay. So this doesn't lock us into any type of nope. software. Not okay. at all. Nope. Okay. It's a windows based platform. So anything that will run on windows, it'll run on this car. Super. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Any other questions for James? All right, so you have a motion before you. Is everyone okay moving this forward to consent? All right, thumbs up. Wonderful, thanks, James. Thank you all. I'm sorry, I, Sam, I didn't thank you for that last presentation. Thank you very much for all the information you had shared with us, so. All right, moving on. Next up, we have transportation impact fees adjustment ordinance, which also requires action. I'm going to welcome April. Hello, and thank you so much uh, for having me tonight. So when we adopted the uh, Transportation Impact Fee Program on March 16th, after that adoption, we were reviewing the ordinance and we found a basically a typing error. Um, and that is during the discussion, we uh, emphasized and went over different options of the maximum defensible rate that, that we were going to implement. And we uh, settled on by your direction that 55% inadvertently inside the ordinance, we still had that 65%. Um, so this is uh, striking about 15 letters uh, and inserting the correct letters. So it's um, I'm asking uh, for a readoption uh, so we can get that typing error corrected. Thanks, April. So just a little bit of a housekeeping thing. Anybody have any questions about that? I'll make a comment, Madam President. I just want April to know she's still my employee of the month, okay? Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Is everyone okay then moving this forward to consent? Wonderful. All right. Thank you, April. Thank you. Have a great night. Next up, we just have some information. Yep, you too. Next up, we have information only 2021 asphalt overlay program. Good evening, council members. My name is Carla Maloney. I am the design engineering manager. Today, I am co-hosting uh, with Eric Preston, our city traffic engineer, about the pavement work, uh, rehabilitation work that we are doing this summer. Next slide. 
So what we have here is the map that shows nine different locations where we intend to do overlay work uh, to our project. Um, let me see here. All of this work is funded with BNO money, solid waste utility money, and also funded by Puget Sound Regional Council. Next slide, please. So we're going to start out with our BNO projects. Next slide. The 212th Street overlay project was recently awarded. Um, just actually on April the 20th, you guys probably have seen it. And this project is, uh, is a project from 72nd Street to just shy of East Valley Highway. Uh, this project, as you know, is funded by BNO and PSRC funds. We did recently receive additional grant money from Puget Sound Regional Council, which means that our investment in the project actually goes down a little bit and their investment goes up a little bit. So that's good news. I wanted to share that with you. Um, I believe that we may be doing another presentation to share a little bit more information with you about that if you're interested. Um, uh, you'll see it on the agenda when it does come up. This project is actually going to be a separate project from our overlay project, uh, which are contracted overlays, which is the next slide um, that we're going to talk about and the remaining of the presentation. So East Valley Highway, as you guys know, is one of those routes that has a lot of truck traffic on it. And it is certainly showing its wear and tear. As you can see here, we have a lot of rutting, we have alligator cracking, and we've done a lot of repairs to it, not just crack sealing, but pothole repairs as well. What we're going to do in our overlay project for this year is we are going to do a lot of pavement uh, repairs. So we're not going to do an overlay on the project on this, on this location quite yet. We're trying to leverage some opportunities for some outside funding. And in the meantime, because we know it's the condition is so poor out there, we wanted to make sure that we provided a drivable surface for our, you know, for our citizens and for our businesses that uh, use the road for transportation. Next slide, please. Another location where we're going to be doing overlays uh, is on Southeast 256, and that goes from one, uh, 108 to 160. It looks like I missed a slide. I'm sorry. Um, we're going to be doing uh, we're going to be doing overlay on between 108th and 116th, and the road is Southeast 208. Um, a lot of you guys are also familiar with this location as it ties into the Benson Highway for you old time folk who uh, remember you know how cities or highways were named. Um, so we're going to go ahead and take care of that work in this project. And again, you'll see a lot of the crack seal work that has happened. Uh, that work is great because it helps to extend the lifetime of the pavement. And we're grateful for that work and been able to hold it out and get the money to do the project right with an overlay. Next location, please. So two, Southeast 256 is also another one of those locations that does ex have quite a bit of traffic volume on it. It is one of the through fares that a lot of people who are living in Covington utilize as a bypass to Kent Kingley. And the work that we're going to be doing on there is going to be between 116th and 120th. We did stop short of the intersection. We wanted to spend some additional time on the intersection, make sure that we got it right. And uh, we are coordinating with utilities because it's a little bit complicated through that area there. Next slide. So the rest of the projects that we have, or the rest of the locations that we have here are uh, funded by solid waste utilities. Next slide, please. So Southeast 248th from 124th Avenue to 132nd, um, we are going to be doing overlays. It's a great shot here of our alligator cracking, just showing the, you know, the wear of the pavement and, you know, from, you know, as long as we've had this road, it just needs, needs that attention. Next slide, please. We also, as part of our solid waste utility uh, project uh, in areas where we are crossing our ADA, or excuse me, crossing uh, crosswalks, uh, we are responsible for doing upgrades to our ADA ramps. So our older ramps are deficient and they don't meet our current ADA standards. And so what we do is we go out there, we make sure that uh, all of the users included are uh, people who have uh, disabilities, have a good place to you know, park themselves at so they can go ahead and check to see what's going on with the traffic coming up and down the street, make sure it's safe for them to cross. And they have ramps that are traversable getting to and from uh, that level landing pad and out into the street where they need to go. Next slide, please. 
The next few pro the next few slides are actually um, uh, we we were doing overlays in these locations, but we also partnered with our transportation team, and um, so. You know, you see the cracked seal photos that we have on this location uh, at Reeton Road, which goes from Guyverson to 104th um, along Woodland Avenue as well. Um, we also have 93rd to 94th corridor in Hazel. I will go ahead and let Eric Preston talk more about the uh, the work that we are doing there for traffic calming. Eric. Thank you, Carla. So yeah, as Carla mentioned, we're working with the overlay design team on some traffic calming options on this corridor. Um, so go ahead to the next slide, please. Uh, we wanted to especially look at um, improving school safety and uh, especially the uh, existing school crosswalks that exist on this corridor. Uh, you can see uh, three dark blue uh, rectangles. We wanted to add some raised crosswalks there, uh, not only to calm the traffic, but to make uh, pedestrians more visible um, as they're crossing the street. And so um, we also wanted to look at um, doing traffic calming throughout the rest of the corridor. So we uh, used the brand new uh, residential traffic calming program the council adopted um, in June of last year. Uh, we coordinated with fire, uh, police, and the school district uh, to consider adding six speed cushions um, that you see in those light green kind of aqua colored boxes um, along the corridor. And so it is those speed cushions um, that uh, went out for a ballot and we did a lot of outreach um, on this. So we, uh, we not only mailed letters with ballots, uh, we conducted uh, several Zoom meetings uh, that were informational to, uh, you know, to work around the COVID restrictions. Um, we also sent reminder postcards and ended up extending the deadline uh, because of some confusing, uh, confusing verbiage and other correspondence. Uh, we accepted votes, votes in multiple ways because we wanted people to uh, just give everyone a chance to vote um, in a way that was comfortable to them. We accepted the paper ballots. Uh, we accepted phone calls, voicemails, emails. And so the voting on this closed uh, just on Friday. And so we're still tabulating the, the results. Uh, we're cross-checking addresses and waiting for those last minute postmarks to arrive uh, before we give a final um, a final decision or a final uh, you know calculation on that. So right now it's looking good and this one uh, might very well pass. So next one, please. So the next contracted overlay would be on the 93rd, 94th, uh, 96th quarter that you see there that runs from South 218th Street all the way down to 240th James. Um, about a mile and a half on the East Hill. So next slide. Um, this one, we also partnered with um, our design team on a potential traffic calming. Uh, this proposal, um, along with fire, uh, police and school district would be eight speed cushions. Uh, you can see those in the light green boxes there. Um, we did um, went through the same process using the same uh, brand new program, um, same outreach, um, letters, Zoom meetings, uh, postcards, um, and accepting votes in the same way. And so uh, this vote also closed on Friday. Uh, this one is not looking good. Um, and so it'll probably, it probably will not pass, but uh, we'll see what the final results uh, give us. So next slide. Council Member Thomas, do you have a question? Real quick, going back to 94, thank you, Madam Chair. Going back to 94th there, you're putting, you're thinking about putting eight speed bumps along 94th? Yes, that was the proposal. Uh, the speed cushions do have channels in them so that emergency vehicles like fire, uh, you know, fire engines, they can pass through without having to go up and over the bumps each time. Still, and school buses, but basically that just seemed like overkill there. <laughs> that is a, a comment that we did get, uh, but it is quite a long corridor. That's true. You're <laughs> right. The dimensions here are not really, yeah, it's a long exactly. ways. But still, that seems like a lot. Okay, thank you. Of course. So the next uh, contracted overlay on Hazel Avenue North. So this is um, a much shorter um, section than what we just talked about. Uh, this is essentially three blocks on, of Hazel between Smith and James, just as you're going up the East Hill. And so this was uh, an existing traffic calming request, if you go to the next slide that uh, we had planned to install last year, actually, um, until we realized that we were going to be overlaying it this year. So we did put it off one year um, to reduce the, uh, to eliminate the rework. And so this um, 
this traffic calming request, it qualified uh, for speed cushions under the old program, uh, primarily because not only speed, but also a lot of cut through traffic. And so uh, this went through the public process pre-COVID. And so uh, we did our um, multiple public meetings of which Rob was definitely part of. Um, and this ballot passed in late 2019. And um, under the new program, it would also uh, qualify as well, scoring um, 79 points. And so um, that's all I have for the traffic calming. Carla, back to you. Oh, and really quickly, Councilmember Larmer has her hand up. Okay. Up mute here. Yeah, thank you. So, Eric, question on that Hazel Avenue, that picture shown, it didn't look terribly bad. Is there a reason we wouldn't do a patch on that? Is it because of the, the calming um, cushions that we are moving straight to overlay versus some sort of patching? Uh, if we go back to the picture, that might help. Carla, cool. do you want to address it? Thanks. Yeah, so what you see here is you, you see reflective cracking that's coming up from the concrete that's underneath it, or at least appears to be. And you'll see that there's a number of patches from work that has gone through there. Um, typically, when we have uh, developers come through and do work, we require them to uh, overlay for the entire width of the roadway or for the lane. Um, what we're doing is we're doing some cleanup work, and we're also doing the overlay as a preventative measure to make sure that that cracking that you see there doesn't expand and then erode the uh, soil that is supporting the concrete and creating a much more difficult uh, repair situation. Okay. All right, thank you. So if we want to go ahead and move forward, there's um, I kind of got a little, the slide's a little out of order, so I apologize. I'll go ahead and talk about the advantages of chip seal. Um, we do have one location on the project where we're going to be doing chip seal. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. Maybe you've seen it in your neighborhood and, and other areas where you've done. Um, essentially, it is a product where we put down uh, liquid asphalt that you see there in the photo, and then we put on rock on top of that. We let traffic, in, excuse me, we then drive over it with a particular piece of uh, equipment to help embed that rock into that asphalt. And then we allow the traffic to drive over the top of that to further secure the rock into the asphalt. What chip sealing is, is a, another method to help preserve the lifetime of the, of the existing pavement. So you guys are familiar with the crack, the crack sealing. This is just a bigger, broader uh, version of that so that that way we can cover a much larger area rather than just a, a particular crack as we go along. It's a little bit faster to do and it has a longer lifespan, uh, I believe, than the crack sealing does. So if you move forward to the next slide. So what we're going to be doing is, <laughs> this is where I say we're going out of order. So now I'm going back to the, the regular overlays. Um, we had, um, we in included two, two city streets on, uh, in the Seven Oaks neighborhood on Southeast 260th and Southeast 263rd. Um, we had the design for that. Um, we pulled that out and then we put it back in because um, there was a commitment that we've had to the neighborhood to get that done. It was, um, Originally, I think scheduled for 2019, but we just didn't have the money for it. And so we were able to go ahead and put it into the project this year because the funding was available. So this is an, oh, this, this, these two locations will be done by overlay. Next slide, please. So Lake Fenwick Road is the location where we will be doing a little bit of overlay and we will be doing a little bit of chip seal and probably a little bit more than just a little for the chip seal. So the overlay portion of it is going to be between Wreath Road and 256th, and then everything south of, two, excuse me, 252nd, everything south of 252nd all the way down to 272nd, the city limits is going to be crack uh, the chip seal. Um, again, like I said, we wanted to try this chip seal product. We want to try the chip seal out. It's not something that we have done in the last few years, but we know that the chip seal is a less expensive way to um, extend the life of the pavement. And we wanted to give it a, a trial run. We want to see how it was going to work to see if this is something that we want to continue to do in the future. So we've selected this location here on Lake Fenwick Road, and we'll see how it goes. We've um, we opened up our bids this morning to our uh, for this for the overlay job, and uh, we're happy with the results that we got, and we're reviewing them, and we hope to bring those bids to you soon. 
uh, for recommendation to, for award. So if you move on to the next slide, please. So in summary, you can see once again our map here, all the different locations that we're doing work. Everything that is highlighted in green is, fun, is work that is funded by BNO. Everything that is in blue is work that is funded by the solid waste utility, with the exception of the red area, which is chip seal, and that's also funded by solid waste utility. Next slide, please. So. We know that we want to make sure that we're letting our residents know of the work that we have going on. Uh, Eric has done a really good job talking about all the effort that has gone on to engage the, our citizens for the traffic calming. So what you see on the right-hand side is the most recent postcard that we sent to our residents, reminding them to go ahead and send in their ballots. And on the left is our notification to residents in the area of where we're actually going to be doing overlay work in our chip seal work. So um, we will be doing another mailer to those same people to let them know when work is going to begin on the project. And we expect that mailer to go out here probably in the next month or two, right before we begin work on the job. Are there any questions? Thank you, Carla and Eric. Um, much needed work to be done. So thank you for this presentation. Anybody have questions or comments about what you've seen? President. Uh, oh, Council Member Michaud and then Council Member Boyce. Thank you, Council President. Uh, I have a quick, thanks for the presentation, first of all. Um, if so, if residents see roads that look like these pictures, how, who should they contact and how do those get prioritized? Oh, I'm going to fail you here. We have an application where residents can actually use their telephones as they're driving down the road. Well, not as they're driving, but maybe their passengers can go ahead and enter it in. They can flag it using GPS to uh, identify that there's a pothole or any type of repair, or even if they see that there's something going on, uh, maybe in a park where there's graffiti or litter or any type of those items. Um, so I believe it is called C-Click Fix and it is available on our website and it's a great tool. Um, we get lots of requests all the time and we use that information to help prioritize our work and to take care of the situations if needed right away. Great, thanks, Carla. Councilmember Boyce. Thank you. My question is similar to Councilmember Show, and um, you know I'm glad to see we are working on the uh, between uh, two fifty six, one sixteen, and one twenty because you can't you got to drive around because there's so many big holes there, right? But if you go further down to two fifty six to one thirty second, it's just as bad, right? So, I mean, how? I mean, in my opinion, that's worse than the one on one sixteen and one twenty, right? So. How do you, what's the plan for, I, mean, I know you only got so much money, you only gonna do so much, but what's the plan of prioritization that 256 to 132nd? I think I might've mentioned something to chat about this before in the past. And uh, that one is probably worse than 116 and uh, 256. So you're absolutely right. There are a number of locations in the city where there is pavement conditions that aren't ideal. Um, you know, in those situations, if, the, if there is a an immediate issue, then we send out our team to go get those potholes taken care of right away. And sometimes we can do some, um, the crack sealing, as we talked about, as a, as a temporary repair until we can go in there and do it later. But we as a, as a public works as a whole, what we do is we evaluate all of the city streets um, and we do a pavement condition report. And that pavement condition report helps to identify um, the, the condition of the streets as to which ones are in uh, very bad condition, worse condition, uh, so on and so forth. I don't know what the exact criteria is or the language that they use to say, you know, bad to bad to good. But we do identify, we do prioritize the projects that are in the, uh, the in, in the worst condition or in very poor condition, uh, repairable condition to be done as part of our overlay project. For those other roads where they are in a very poor condition, where doing an overlay might just be a temporary fix, we have to evaluate some other mechanism to address the project, such as substantial repairs to the pavement or you know, do a, a, a total reconstruction of the pavement. Our goal is to not let our roads get there, so we want to work on those that are in, in uh, repairable condition 
tackle those and then put a plan together for how we're going to handle those other roads that are in worse condition. That answer your question? Yeah, you did. And I don't mind following the process. If I need to load the app, I will. But I'm telling you, 256 to 132nd, you find people driving and ducking around trying to fit some of those, those holes, right? So on my way home, I try to load the app and I'll send it in. But I strongly encourage you, nothing else, just take a look at it because there's some big holes at the intersection need to be addressed that have been there for a long time. Chad, do you want to add something to that? Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Council Member Boyce. I did pass that on to Dave Brock, and we're looking at that for some spot repairs this summer uh, using other crews. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, anybody else have any questions or comments about these projects? Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. We will move on. Next up, we have the Consolidated Budget Adjustment Ordinance, and this is for January 1st through March 31st. So welcome, Michelle. Good evening, Council. I'm Michelle Ferguson, the Financial Planning Manager, and I will be presenting the first quarter budget adjustment for 2021. This first quarter adjustment is reflecting an overall budget increase of $5,509,571. Previously approved budget expenditure increases total $2,850,011. And budget adjustments that have not been previously approved by council total $2,659,560. For the majority of this presentation, I'll be using rounded numbers, but the ordinance and exhibits contain the exact budget expenditure figures. The expenditure increases of 2.85 million that council has previously approved include 1.8 million in grants and 956,000 in carry forward budgets. The grants included in this budget change are 1.5 million from the Washington State Department of Transportation Local Programs Grants for the Russell to GRE section of the Meeker project that was approved by council in January. 332,000 for interlocal agreements from the King County Flood Control District Subregional Opportunity Funds for the Lake Fenwick Aerator Drainage Project that was approved by Council in February. And 61,000 in criminal justice grants, which include 3,900 from the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs for a traffic equipment grant, 16,500 for a phlebotomy program grant, and 40,700 for a justice assistant grant for camera systems, SWAT vision goggles, and crime scene van equipment. They carry forward budgets totaling 956,000. Is it faster or they're taking them in faster? Uh, are included in this amendment are 545,000 for show COVID related reopening expenses that were funded with CARES funding. 225,000 for COVID related laptops and accessories that were fund were also funded with CARES funding and 186,000 for fleet vehicles that were ordered in 2020 but not received in the same year. The remaining adjustments that total $2,659,560 uh, council has not yet approved. There are increases that total 4.11 million and decreases that total 1.45 million. The 1.45 million in budget decreases include a reduction of the citywide workers' compensation and liability insurance allocations. These allocations are usually adjusted during the first quarter of each year after we receive updated actuarial studies that factor in prior year data. These yearly adjustments are needed to reallocate the funding based on experience. The worker compensation fund allocation was reduced by $244,000 because the adopted budget was a little high and the current fund balance is above the targeted amount. The budget related to the liability allocations is being reduced by $52,000, but the overall amount that is actually allocated to the liability insurance fund has not been reduced. Um, this is because expenditures within the street engineering and utility clearing funds are allocated out to the utility funds. So when the liability expense increased within those funds, the offsetting negative allocation to the utility funds increased as well. A budget reduction of 1.11 million is needed for the parks land acquisition project in order to correct a 556,000 RCO grant adjustment that we did in December of 2020 that was mistakenly 
uh, recorded as an increase instead of a decrease. A budget reduction of 42,000 is needed for the drainage fund for the Downey Farmstead project budget due to the expiration of a King County grant. Of the 4.11 million in increased budget adjustments, over 1.77 million has been counted for twice for accounting purposes. We have to budget the expense transfer out of a fund and then the expense within the project and or operating budget. So a budget change of 1.76 million is needed to establish a budget for prior year B&O revenue transfers to the street unallocated B&O projects. A budgeted transfer out of the general fund for 881,000 needs to be created and then the use of 881,000 has to be budgeted within the project. No actual revenues will be transferred. This is just a budget change that's needed to have the budget catch up with the actual amount within the project. The actual funds were transferred into this project in 2017 and 2018. A budget change of 1.64 million is needed to complete the city's remaining matching por portion of the Washington State Department of Transportation CMAC grant. 820,000 will be transferred out of the Capital Resources Fund and into the Russell to GRE portion of the Meeker project, and 820,000 will be budgeted within the project for the use of those funds. 231,000 will be budgeted in the Criminal Justice Fund in order to use seized funds. A portion of the prior year state seized funds will be used to purchase four special investigation unit detective vehicles and gladiator software, which total $216,000. $15,000 VNet federal forfeiture revenues will be budgeted as well with the offsetting expense. A budget change of $200,000 is needed in the drainage fund. This budget change is related to the homeless camp cleanup budget that was established within the 21-22 budget. The budget was originally established in the drainage operating fund, but after some consideration, it was decided that it would be beneficial to move these funds to two separate projects in order to track them better. One for public works and one for parks. So 200,000 will be transferred out of the drainage operating fund and 100,000 will be budgeted in each of the projects for use of those funds. Council Member Lambert, did you have a question before we move on? Yeah, a couple questions. Um, first, do we know what the Gladiator software is? Um, it's, um, it's a kind of a forensic software that helps analyze call records. Oh, okay. I don't have more beyond that. Okay. And then, um, on the criminal justice on the seized funds, did you say this is coming from our state? It's like our portion of the state seized funds? The, the 216,000 is from the state seized funds and then the VNet is federal. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, um, so a budget change for 140,000 is needed in the IT fund for the EGIS project. IT is working with Esri as a part of the Advantage program in order to capture and assess the current enterprise GIS servers architecture and determine and implement a new architecture that meets the needs of the entire enterprise, which includes other business systems and department GIS staff. 70,000 will be transferred out of the IT fund balance, and then 70,000 will be budgeted in the project for use of those funds. A $96,000 budget change is needed for the sales tax revenues for affordable housing related to House Bill 1590 and 1406. When the 21-22 budget was established, the revenues and related expenditures for House Bill 1406 were receded in the general fund. And due to the timing of the adopted budget and House Bill 1590, only a very small portion of the House Bill 1590 revenues and related expenditures were part of the 21-22 adopted budget. In order to keep all of these new sales tax revenues and expenditures separate and better accounted for, they are now being receded in the Human Services Fund. This budget change includes removing the related revenues and expenditures from the general fund and budgeting them in the Human Services Fund and then transferring 100000 from the Human Services budget to the general fund for the police co-responder program. 
A $39,000 budget change is needed for allocation adjustments related to a new utility clearing account. A new streets utility clearing account was created to allocate over 20 street related positions to various street funding sources. This new utility clearing account is not actually increasing the city's overall budget, but due to a portion of this budget being allocated to a project which already has a budget, only positions related to operating budgets were altered. So overall, this new change in how a portion of streets positions are allocated will have a net zero effect on the budget. Are there any questions? All right, questions for Michelle. Councilmember Boyce. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, Michelle, does it make sense, is it value added to compare um, first quarter to the previous quarter when you're looking at this here? I'm just curious if that it, is that say value added thing. To, to compare this quarter to last year's first quarter? Yeah. Not really, because, you know, some of this is just clean up, you know, like the the one from cleaning up uh, the B&O revenue um, mm -hmm. from 2017 and 18. That's a one time thing. So you can't really okay. compare it, okay. you know, that's that's, good. you know, a uh -huh. over a million dollars. OK, that's good. Thank you. And then the other one, as far as the 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 expenditure fund is between grants, existing fund balance and um other revenue. So the existing fund balance, the only adjustment was at 96K that you talked about from the fund balance adjustment. Oh, for the affordable housing sales tax? Yeah. Yeah, that one was just accounting for it differently. We'll be coming forward in the second quarter of budget adjustments um, to fully budget the new um, um, sales tax revenues because that did not make it into last year's budget okay okay all right thank you all right any other questions for michelle all right so like we do with all of these quarterly budget adjustments we move this forward to consent is everyone okay doing that moving this to consent calendar all right wonderful lots of thumbs up thank you everyone thank you michelle for joining us thank you and that brings us to the end of our committee meeting this evening. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I hope you all got to enjoy some of the sunshine today. I think it's going to continue for a little bit longer. So get outside, take care of yourself, stay safe and have a great night. Thank you very much, we are adjourned. get dirty. Thank you for tuning in today. Hopefully we see you in person next time, but hopefully you also learned a lot in our presentation. 